Hello and thanks very much for joining us. So we're going to be talking to you today about a large public transport investment program that WSB has been working on in the UK, the delivery of which we successfully completed on the ground last year. And it's an example of a program where we took the opportunity to of the substantial investment to embed uh, the principles of equity and social value into our delivery approach. Just some housekeeping before we get started. Uh, the slides are available to download in the handouts panel on your control panel. Um, we're going to talk to you for about 20 minutes um, and we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. So if you do have any questions as we go through, if you just pop those into the questions box, we'll address as many as we can in the time we have available. Next slide, Tom. So my name is Simon Pope. I'm a technical director in WSP's transport business in the UK. Um, and I was the programme manager on the Leeds Public Transport Investment Programme, where we acted as the development partner for our client. Tom? My name is Tom Hackett. I'm an associate director, also based in the Leeds team. And I was the assistant programme manager supporting Simon with the delivery of the Leeds Public Transport Investment Programme. So I am now going to talk you through our agenda. So. I will be providing a background to the Leeds Public Transport Investment Programme, the geography that we were working in, the type of projects that were delivered and how that aligns with the wider social value and equity agenda. And then a combination of me and Simon will talk through some of the key innovations associated with the delivery of this programme. And then hopefully we'll offer some interesting takeaways uh, before opening up for some Q&A opportunities. So the first thing I want to do is provide you with a brief overview of the, the geography. So West Yorkshire is in north of England. Um, it is uh, home to several million people. Uh, Leeds is one of the districts within the Leeds city region and West Yorkshire region. Um, it is the, the centre of that region, the largest employment centre and home to many of the key sports, leisure, education facilities. There is an existing and wide bus and rail network, um, but there are a number of challenges with the bus network uh, where improvements could deliver uh, social value and equitable benefits to people who work and live in the area. So why the bus network? Why would we choose to invest in the bus network? The There's Good accessibility to the bus network so the vast majority of people in the Leeds area live within a short walk of a bus stop and uh, almost everybody lives within a slightly longer 800 metre walking distance of a bus stop. Buses have had a lot of improvement in, in investment already in the last 10 years or so. Um, most or almost all of them are accessible and have accessible features. They're very high quality uh, desirable and a uh, strong alternative to the car and the rail network and um, very appealing to users and then also there is an affordable ticket arrangement particularly at the moment with people say paying a few pounds for a one-way journey um, which all means that this was a good opportunity for Leeds City Council as the highway authority and their uh, regional transport partners to deliver some significant improvements so what were those improvements? The Leeds Public Transport Programme was a vast investment of over £270 million in infrastructure and buses themselves over a four-year period. There were a number of key partners deliver, delivering this programme, WSP as the design partner, and we'll come on to that in a bit more detail in a second. There are an, a long list of projects in, included in that programme some very large, um, many millions of pounds, um, and some much smaller, but still delivering some benefits. At any one moment in time, there were well over 100 people fully employed as designers, as contractors within the council, um, with their partners helping drive this program forward during that four year period from a standing start and some very early concepts through to the commissioning of the, the infrastructure. So here we can see some of the key partners with Leeds City Council as the promoter and client at the top. They are the Highway and Planning Authority for the Leeds District. 
Then we can see there is the regional um, transport authority and in this instance the the funding body, the West Yorkshire Combined Authority, which brings together districts from across the West Yorkshire region. There were two key contractors that were brought in to deliver elements of the programme, uh, John Sisk on the left there and Bam Nuttall. WSP were, played a wide reaching role, but primarily focused around design. Uh, we oversaw, we had a project management role overseeing a wide range of activities. We did the highway design, the landscape design, structures and a range of other design associated services, public transport, business case and the other things that you can see there. So a really wide range um, and full offer that reflected WSP's global service offering. So I want to do is give you some examples of the types of schemes that we were delivering. So we delivered three large city centre gateway projects which delivered significant improvements in terms of bus service journey times, service reliability and the experience of waiting for and using a bus but we were also able to layer in a number as you can see in this, this graphic here. I appreciate there's no before image but real big improvements to urban realm around a grade two listed corn exchange here um, and improved accessibility, landscaping, range of other um, social value and equitable benefits associated with the infrastructure delivered. Again here on the corridors that run in and out of the city we delivered primarily bus infrastructure and bus benefits but we were able to enhance cycling and walking facilities, um, some landscaping, uh, road safety improvements and really try to improve the, the setting of um, several small settlements within the district outside the, the city centre itself. The flagship scheme within the LTP, LPTIP programme, I think in both mine and Simon's opinion, was the Sturton Park and Ride. So Leeds City Council have had a vision to deliver a park and ride here for many decades and we were able to make it happen through this programme. There are over a thousand spaces, there are fantastic facilities, there are full electric services uh, running on a 10 minute frequency. As you can see, extensive landscaping with several thousand trees delivered and um, planted and also uh, European Union funding used to deliver um, solar panel carports that help make sure that this site is sustainable. This is now fully operational. It's a site that I use frequently and it's very, very popular with um, commuters, um, people travelling into Leeds for retail and leisure and, and other purposes. Before I pass over to Simon, I just want to give a very brief overview of what the programme looked like. We took the public on the journey with us, we'll go into that in more detail, and we undertook three phases of consultation that broadly aligned with a concept level design, a preliminary level design, and then a detailed design. The final design stage obviously confirming with the public what the, the, the scheme would look like when delivered. Construction work began in 2019 and all of the works were on site or complete by the end of the 2020 to 2021 financial year. Simon? Great, thanks Tom. Um, we just wanted to talk you through now a few some of the key innovations we deployed as part of the project. And the, the first one I wanted to focus on was the role of consultation. And Tom's already alluded to it, but it was, it was a really key input to the whole development process. Um, and it involved us developing a, a, an instantly recognisable brand in, the, in connecting leads, which was then used on all of our communications and engagement activity. We also had to ensure that there was sufficient time dedicated within the programme to enable a meaningful response to the issues that were identified through the consultation process. So we did that, as Tom alluded to, through undertaking consultation in a phased way. Um, the first phase really being used to verify the issues that we were aware of and seek feedback on some of the trade-offs from adopting different approaches in design to try and address those issues. And we're then in subsequent phases, we were able to go and demonstrate how the design had responded to that feedback in a kind of you said we did way. 
and then ultimately seek further feedback on the preferred design solution that then resulted. It was this phased approach and the, and the approach of ensuring that we had sufficient time to enact meaningful response that really gave politicians the confidence that we were listening to local concerns and embedding them into the design process. Next slide, Tom. So one of the key considerations as part of the consultation approach was the accessibility of the consultation itself. So this involved us developing traditional printed materials and promotion of in-person events using things like digital advertising, newspaper adverts and on-bus promotion to try and capture potential users of the scheme. But the great majority of our consultation and engagement actually happened through online formats involving an online portal for people to view designs, but also to provide their feedback. This meant we also had to deploy a comprehensive social media campaign to really generate interest and debate in the programme as it evolved and developed. We also translated our materials into different languages and into Braille to reflect the diversity of the communities that the, the bus improvements were intended to serve and hosted a series of one-to-one -one events with certain user groups to better understand specific issues that they faced on the ground. As a consequence of all these different measures that we were able to secure over 100,000 responses to the consultation, which is actually the highest level of engagement the Council has ever received on a transport engagement, and has effectively served as a best practice example that the Council has gone on to emulate in future consultations that have since happened on the back of it. Next slide. Another conceived consideration for us around the consultation was it's the, necessar the necessity for transparency. Early in the process, the Council took the brave decision to adopt an online portal that enabled visibility of all the comments that everyone was providing, so everyone could see what everyone else had commented upon. And this was really useful because it actually started to show people that there were different opinions to their own and conflicting views, not everyone thought the same. It was also really useful because it provided an evidence trail to show how we as designers were responding to the feedback that we received. It was this open and transparent process that enabled us to win hearts and minds of the users of the infrastructure that we were designing for. Um, so, such that even where some people still perhaps objected to certain interventions on the completion of the design process, our ability to demonstrate that the consultation had been robust and we'd acted upon uh, measures where, able, where we were able to do so, it reduced the risk of challenge and potential delays to delivery. Next slide, Tom. Another key focus for us as part of the consultation was on seldom heard groups, so those groups that are typically underrepresented in these types of consultations. So that includes vulnerable users, the mobility impaired, uh, members of the BAME community, those on lower incomes, those with language or literacy barriers. And we undertook extensive community outreach with these groups using a third sector organisation partner that had specific links into the communities that we wanted to engage. So this partner helped us organise events and engagement, primarily using existing channels to try and maximise the reach of our consultation approach. And they also helped us tailor our materials and the approach we were adopting for different user needs. And this approach has since been adopted by the Council across all their future consultations as an example of best practice. But ultimately, it was the, the key thing that enabled us to ensure that the designs we went on to develop were fully inclusive and reflected the needs of all the different users across the city. Next slide. So one of the key challenges we faced as part of the consultation was communicating often complex evidence to a range of different audiences. So one example we're showing here is where we developed a video where car drivers were concerned about the loss of capacity from delivering a bus lane and the potential impact they perceived it would result in. So we developed this animation and the graphics you can see here to try and improve understanding that we then played at consultation events and made available online. And this really showed that some of the perceived impacts were unlikely to materialise in practice. And it also enabled us to articulate the greater equity of the design solution in terms of the number of people it would benefit as opposed to the number of, opposed to the number of vehicles. Next slide. The second innovation I just wanted to, to focus on briefly is around the approach, our approach to design itself. So the design needed to overcome the marginalisation of bus users, often 
um, experiencing delays which we wanted to overcome. Um, we wanted to try and create bus only streets. We wanted to restrict access for general traffic and generally improve waiting facilities for bus users. But in the constrained city centre environment, we also needed to try and help realise placemaking and regeneration ambitions of the council. So this required us to consider the needs of different users, recognising that cultural as well as business and retail reasons that people might be accessing the city centre. So there are lots of touch points for us to consider as part of the design, including from those that live in the city centre versus those that just access it, and a range of different user groups, whether that's families, the elderly, students and so on. We also had to think about some of the complex operational requirements that needed to be embedded into the design, whether that's around servicing or potentially access for the disabled, uh, the need to try and use design to minimise things like antisocial behaviour and the need to embed counter-terrorism measures from a, a safety and security perspective. Given the constrained environment, we had to reprioritise the use of space, challenging the existing hierarchy that often favoured private vehicles over pedestrians and ultimately providing more space for people and critically for bus users. Finally, when it came to materials, uh, we had to think not just about the aesthetic and maintenance consideration of those materials, but we also had to consider the impact on different user groups. So we actually built a test palette of the materials that we were looking at to try and secure some feedback on the legibility and any safety considerations associated with those materials from visually impaired users. Next slide. Where we were impacting on adjacent stakeholders, we took the approach of trying to bring those stakeholders into the design process to secure ownership of the solutions that we developed. So here we've got an example of a city centre street where we removed vehicles altogether from the street to try and avoid turning movements that were delaying buses. This enabled us to enhance the environment significantly for pedestrians and cyclists, whilst also creating an event space for cultural activities. But in doing so, we had to displace disabled parking that was previously located on the street. So we worked with relevant user groups to try and identify better locations and increase supply of disabled parking that was actually better located close to key attractors in the city centre. We also worked with a hotel that was located on the street that were concerned about the loss of vehicular access to their front door. So by working with them, we developed a dedicated drop-off facility nearby and we also sought their views on the design of the space in front of their front door to ensure that we were able collaboratively to create a welcoming environment for their guests. And it was this collaborative approach with both stakeholders that helped ensure the stakeholders actually became an advocates for the scheme, broadening the support and the champions for the scheme beyond just bus users alone. Tom? Thank you for that, Simon. I'm going briefly talk about some of the wider social value activities beyond the delivery of the infrastructure itself uh, and there's a couple here I want to touch on. Uh, the first of which is that we were able to offer um, a number of people work experience, um, not just work experience but to offer work experience to people who would otherwise find it very challenging to get work experience full stop and certainly to get work experience in the construction engineering sector. So we worked with a local charity or based in the UK, Mencap, to make that happen. We created a, a long list of jobs that were advertised and, and filled quickly, including a number of apprenticeship positions, which is fantastic. And those people played a really significant role and progressed through the life of the project. We worked with across all our partnerships to deliver volunteering. Um, with various local charities. Beyond just giving our time, we uh, um, raised funds to support some of those charities. We went into local schools, colleges, universities and such like to share our experiences and to help upskill the engineers and planners of the future. So I think this was uh, a, a step change in what would be expected of partners working on a, on a programme of this scale. Finally, before we open up for some Q&A, and I've got some questions um, that we can come to, uh, I wanted to pull out some, some key takeaways here for those who've um, taken time to attend the presentation. So the first takeaway is around deep and meaningful engagement with communities. And Simon really went into great detail there as to give examples around who those um, people might be and what that engagement might look like, not just presenting something to them, but 
um, enabling them to see and touch and feel some of the infrastructure um, so they could uh, engage in that process. And then once you've got all that information, that data about how people feel, then using that very carefully in the design process and making sure that we balanced different people's needs and presented a scheme which delivered as much social value as possible to the wider community and users. The third takeaway is around very close collaborative working between partners. So the partners listed on the previous slide were working out of the same office, were wearing the same lanyards, were sharing the same experiences and driven towards the same objectives. And uh, this is what enabled us to deliver so much within such a short period of time. Um, so those are our three key takeaways. I had one question and something that occurred to me while I was presenting that I'll cover off first, Simon, before we open up, um, which was the I referenced grade two listed corn exchange, which is um, uh, a something that people may not have heard of before. So this is a, a statutory heritage protection categorization. What does that mean? Well, it's a, a way in which we identify um, structures and infrastructure that has significant cultural and historical value, and they are then protected by law. Uh, grade one, two or three uh, may, how it's categorized might influence what, what you can do and how it's done in the ones. Um, so apologies for that. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Simon, for a fantastic presentation. So before moving to the Q&A session, I, I would just mention quickly the housekeeping items. Please continue to log your questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel. And also you can find there at the handout box with a PDF of this presentation. I will start with the first question. What were the key risks in this project? Do you want me to say that one, Tom? Um, yeah, you take risks, I'll take next, yeah. Okay. So. Uh, Quite, quite many and varied, I suppose. In, in short, I mean, we, we alluded to the timescales earlier on, um, and one of the the main challenges for us was that the, the funding that was identified from government to support delivery of the program was was time limited, and that meant that we had to to move from a, effectively a standing start of not knowing what we were going to deliver to actually getting the schemes completed and on the ground within a short four year period, and that was very challenging um, and created a lot of risks and uncertainty. So what we needed to try and do as part of the delivery process was ensure that um, we had, you know, we, we, we mitigated as many risks as we could such that we, we had confidence that we were able to spend the funding in the available funding window. And one of the, the main risks we felt that was a, that, that, that posed a threat to that um, was around securing approval and buy into the schemes that were delivered. And that's really why we spent so much time on, on the consultation process. One of the things we, we did as part of that, which perhaps didn't mention earlier, was around the evidence and, and the need to really demonstrate the evidence to a, a broad range of stakeholders to secure that buy-in. Um, and that's why we, we felt we had to, um, uh, as well as obviously doing the technical work that was needed to underpin the design decisions we were making, we had to put quite a significant amount of emphasis in terms of how some of those complex um, justifications and evidence that we had available were then communicated to other stakeholders and, and members of the public. So I suppose in terms of risk, it, it was really the timescales and, and, and how we how we looked to address that. Thank you. What consents or power were used to deliver this the project? Do you want me to pick that one up, Simon? Uh, yeah. So um, the bulk of the infrastructure particularly along the corridors that uh, into and out of the city centre, that could be delivered um, by the council through something in the UK called permitted development rights. So um, depending on the scale of change, if that change sits within the, the highway boundary, then um, there are fewer hoops to, to jump through because the, the council and the highway authority has more powers. So um, we, Everything it, it depend on where people are attending from. Um, they will have different appreciation of this, but certain powers were sought to deliver changes to parking, uh, loading, and the delivery of bus lanes and other things. But generally, those things could be delivered quite quickly. I think we had more of a challenge um, when we got to the park and ride sites and several other bits of infrastructure that required um, a more formal uh, planning approval. 
Um, and at that point, we had to deliver wider environmental assessments and such like. Um, anything to that, Simon? Uh, no, I think you've covered things. Thank you. Uh, did you check for traffic integration along the route and passenger needs? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think as we've alluded to in the, in the slides, you know, getting the understanding the needs of different users was was fundamental to our approach, and, and obviously that included the needs of, of bus passengers. When it came to traffic integration, um, yeah, absolutely. I think one of the concerns of, of the, the politicians that ultimately approved the scheme was that they needed to ensure that the delivery of the proposals wasn't going to um, significantly disrupt the, the existing uh, traffic network in the city. Um, so we undertook extensive traffic modelling to inform um, what the likely impacts of, of the proposals were likely to be. Um, where possible, we tried to minimise the impact on, on general traffic um, because often we found that where we would had an impact on general traffic, it could actually result in a delay to buses. Um, so that we tried to minimise that insofar as possible. Um, in locations where we more we had were more constrained on space, particularly in the city centre, um, we adopted a hierarchy approach whereby you know pedestrians and, and, and bus users and cyclists were at the top of that hierarchy, um, and obviously that meant that we did have to reallocate uh, road space away from other road users. But very much you know the consideration of traffic integration was a fundamental part of the design process. Thank you. Uh, did you encounter any objection? Did anyone or any groups uh, object to the project or, or ideas, concepts? So the short answer is, is yes, but I think the longer answer is that we um, experienced and observed potentially lower levels of objection and frustration than maybe would have been um, experienced on um, similar projects in the past and that's because we went so far or much further um, than, than others would to engage the public and stakeholders and explain the rationale and involve them in the process but admittedly um, the, almost no matter how much of that you do there will still be people who um, don't support the strategic aims of the, the, the scheme or they, they maybe do support the strategic aims of the scheme ultimately they are maybe worse off than, than other people, for example, certain landowners um, and such like. So yes, we encountered um, objections. We put a process in place. Uh, we gave that a lot of care of attention. And most importantly, I think we used a lot of data to support um, our rationale rather than simply saying we're doing this because this is what we've always done or this is what somebody else thinks we should do. Um, and that really helped us with those discussions. Thanks for clarifying this. Um, I will take the last question. Was this ex exclusively a council-led or were there other uh, stakeholders involved? So yeah, the, the very much were with the stakeholders involved. Um, I don't know, some of you may not appreciate, but in, in, the, in the UK we actually have a, a deregulated bus market. So that means that our bus services outside of London are run by private operators. The council doesn't have direct control over where those services run or the standard that they're delivered to. So it was really important for the council um, and the other partners working on the program to ensure that we had complete um, buy-in and um, commitment from the operators from the outset. Um, so the operators were fundamental in uh, the council securing the money um, from government for the investment in infrastructure because the, the, the operators in parallel were putting significant investment into the fleet. So a completely new bus fleet was delivered um, at the operator's cost. When it came to consulting on the on the proposals and promoting the scheme when it was delivered, it was very much the, the council and the bus operators speaking with one voice. So the, 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 the um, public transport programme as a whole was promoted to, to residents of the city as an integrated, um, um, integrated deliverable, both reflecting the, the, the vehicles themselves, but also the, the infrastructure that they were running on. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tom and Simon, for a fantastic presentation. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We hope to see you in our upcoming uh, webinars, and all additional questions will be answered directly by the presenters. Feel free to reach out to them via the contact details shown on the screen. And have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.